Today on Context, relationships under renovation. Hollywood has its own ideas about love, marriage, and romance. I'm here to fall in love and get married. And the digital revolution has changed dating, marriage, and connection forever. I'm married, <laughs> and it worked face to face. Honestly, before, face to face was cool, but now it's online, right? Today, we delve into how marriage can actually save your life the changing shifts in attitudes and beliefs about relationships, and a call to put marriage and divorce stats back on the Canadian census. And throughout today's program, we'll bring you stories of a different kind of love from a reality show in California called Young Ones. I'm Lorna Duick. I'm Molly Thomas. And I'm Sheldon Neal. And this is Context. Understanding love and companionship can be like walking through a minefield, just one wrong move and it feels like you're done. Nicole McCants is a psychologist and Canada's leading relationship expert. She joins me now to help make sense of it all. Nicole, great to have you. Thanks for having me, yeah. Nicole, let's talk about dating. Let's start with dating. It seems like everybody's online. The apps are filling up our phones. Uh, do people meet face-to-face -face anymore? Very rarely. I'm actually a big proponent of online dating. It is perfect for the busy person. It is perfect for the picky person. It's like shopping, right? So I, people rarely meet face-to-face uh, um, -face anymore, but I think it works, especially if you can barely go out because of the snow. That's true. That is true. In Canada, we, we do have a good excuse to use it. Do you worry, though, yeah. Nicole, that people uh, just aren't talking to people, though? They, they'd rather, you know, leave the person beside them, run home and talk to them on the app instead of just engaging? Yes. And I actually, I mean, it works for the person that is shy because they can take a moment to think about their response. But what often does happen is when you meet the shy person face to face, you realize like, oh, I was wasting my time because it was easier to chat online. Do you know what I mean? So that can be difficult for some people. Okay, I want to talk about The Bachelor. It's my guilty pleasure. I watch it every week. Uh, you know, there's an argument, of course, people go on there for fame, all these different reasons. But the ultimate storyline is about love and marriage. Uh, why are we so fixated on a traditional concept, I guess, in 2019? Yeah, well, I think my clients tell me, the single ones particularly, that it gives them hope. They watch this man that is loving, and again, you see that there are some good men out there still, and you watch people fall in love and let their guard down. So I think that I'm noticing a trend where less people do want to get married, but they're all looking for love. Uh, they're putting off, you know, uh, marriage, they're putting off kids, but in the end, they're just desperately wanting that partnership. Uh, Nicole, let's talk about what makes a healthy relationship. What makes a healthy marriage? Mm, so many things. I think that I see um, a lot of people not focusing on their partner's strengths. So we have to remember that our partner is not us, although it'd be really great if they, it, they were just like us. <laughs> our partner cannot read our mind. So they are gonna bring to the table things that you don't like, but focusing on, okay, what are their strengths and what do they bring? So that's number one. Uh, number two, what makes a good marriage or relationship is empathy, right? Like those partners that last are able to put themselves in their partner's shoes and say, I may not agree with you, but I understand that you're having this emotion. Is there a time, Nicole, when, when you know, so many couples out there are thinking, maybe I need help, maybe I don't know. Uh, is there a point where you can be like, yes, you need to seek help right now? Great question. A lot of people put it off way too long. I find that when couples come to see me, they are at the breaking point. So I'm a big fan of if you're the first time that you're contemplating therapy, that's the day that you should pick up the phone and go in because the average person waits about six months to a year later. And then it's like a train wreck that we're trying to fix rather than something that's a bit breaking down and we're being proactive. Yeah, be proactive. That's great. That's great tips for us. Nicole, great to have you on the program. Thank you for all the tips. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Molly. Well, young people living alone and not finding love is at a 20-year high in Canada. And it's not a good sign, says a group of leading academics. They say counting how many people are married is a vital piece of data for our country, and they've taken their fight to Ottawa for a government wake-up call. Joining me now is Andrea Mrozek, Cardis Family Program Director. Hi, Andrea, and why does counting our national marriage level even matter? 
The marriage rate matters because it's an indicator of the health of our country and our communities. It can speak into social policy and welfare policy. Um, things like social isolation, a pressing issue today, we can learn a lot from the marriage rate and simply having that marriage rate is a fairly basic statistic to, to have at StatCan. Okay, so uh, what are you learning about the increase in young people living alone? Well, we, we know that the marriage rate is from prior data that we no longer have as up to date as it should be. We, we know that marriage rates are declining, cohabitation rates are increasing. Um, cohabitation and marriage are not the same thing, however, um, and marriage is kind of the gold standard for lifelong love in spite of a high divorce rate. We'd also like to get the divorce rate back while I'm at it. Okay, so let's go back a bit to this idea that you don't really understand the health of your communities, the health of your country, if you don't know the divorce and marriage rates. Explain that a bit more, what, how deeply ingrained that is with community building. Uh, well, it's, as I mentioned, a basic data point. I know when we've spoken to the various academics who signed on to the joint letter, one of them indicated that some elder care policy had been designed based on the divorce rate that it indicated levels of people who would be living alone. We know we have a, a gray door, a divorce phenomenon that more older people get divorced. So um, we need to be able to track these things to create good social policy. And that's what good data is all about, evidence-based policy. Okay, so I'm gonna go to a data chart that did come from one of your Cardis articles here, which does give us an indication here about the um, numbers here. You've got them on the screen. That top line there is the married couples. Pardon me, the top line is the not married or common law. Like that's the singleness rate for people 20 to 34. 58%, I don't think people realize that's how much um, not permanent relationships are going on. It's almost 60% in people 20 to 34. Are you um, alarmed at that rate? The single person family household became the largest category of family household. I think in the last census we learned that um, there's it's cause for concern. We could start with the fact that it's not what most people want. Most people would like to be in relationship and, and find lifelong love. We can also talk about the benefits of marriage as the gold standard for raising children. So again, all kinds of issues are correlated uh, with uh, marriage rate and it's I think important to measure it for that reason. All right, Andrea Mrozek, thank you very much from the Cardis Family Institute, thank you. Thank you. If less people are entering relationships and getting married, could that lead to an increase in loneliness in our society? Research shows, yes, loneliness is on the rise. As our senior population grows, Molly Thomas looks at how happiness and loneliness fit into the conversation. The draw of Canada's big cities. Great jobs, big money, and always something to do. Just some of the reasons 80% of Canadians now live in urban centres. But a condo culture has changed the view because many are taking life in on their own. A 2018 study on happiness from McGill and UBC says Canadians are generally happier in smaller towns and cities. The common thread, shorter commute times, affordable housing, and generally homogenous populations that identify as religious. Now, that doesn't mean these factors cause happiness, but they could correlate. Now, since the 80s, multiple studies have shown how close relationships with families and friends generally leads to longer, healthier lives. However, North America is rapidly changing. Fewer couples are having kids or even getting married. Attendance at places of worship are on the decline, and the number of people living alone is at an all-time high. Isolation has become so normalized, some people don't even realize it's happening. It doesn't even occur to me to invite someone if I'm going hiking or to the movies. Um, and then all of a sudden I realized that there's this, I was straddling this weird place maybe between being alone and feeling lonely. Many new immigrants are worse off. While they come to Canada for a better life, they often leave behind neighborhoods of family ties and aging parents they personally housed. And independent Canadian culture is often a rude awakening for many. Loneliness is so pervasive in North America, medical professionals warn it's worse than obesity. New research in the Harvard Business Review compares the lethalness of loneliness to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And there's a host of other health problems too. It's cardiovascular functioning, neuroendocrine functioning, uh, immune functioning, and even cellular aging. 
Now, some might assume kids and teens are better off, constantly plugged into at least a social network, but technology is creating a false sense of community for many. Researchers from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine say the more young people use social media, the more they feel socially isolated. The UK is leading the global charge when it comes to loneliness. They are the first country in the world to appoint a minister for loneliness. Only the lonely. I'm not alone, right? Like I have my mom and my brother and I have my kids. In spite of having them in my life, I still feel lonely. Let's bring in Dr. Amy Rokesh on this. He's an expert in loneliness research and has been studying the topic for more than three decades. Doctor, you've called loneliness an epidemic when it comes to seniors. What exactly does that look like in that population? Loneliness is an epidemic all over mm -hmm. with everyone, especially with two groups, the emerging adults aged 18 to 26 and the elderly. The elderly can be uh, divided into three groups. 65 to 74, 74 to 85, and 85 and up. It is those who are 85 and up which are the loneliest of the elderly. Mm -hmm. And that stems from the fact that uh, they may have been moved to a residential facility. Uh, they have lost possibly a spouse, uh, their friends are dying, and their health is failing. Mm. So doctor, what can we do? For, for our elders as we think of people 85 and up that are alone and, and don't have a lot of social uh, s stability really? Uh, mainly there are two things we can do. One is to try and help them understand that not every time they are alone, they are lonely. They could turn it into solitude and enjoy being alone. The second thing uh, I've heard elderly say, well, no one wants to be with me. Nobody's interested in me. If you will make them interested in you, if you will extend your hand, if you will know how to connect with people, they will be interested in you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and another thing is that we mostly expect the elderly to come out of their place and go out into the community. And I think that the community needs to go more uh, into their homes, into their apartments. Uh, programs that are starting in other places and in Toronto as well brings the elderly, those who are well-functioning, into high schools. And the kids teach them things they don't know, usually computer skills, and the elderly share some of their wisdom with them. So then Everybody so better? So then, doctor, do we need to step outside of our uh, maybe westernized, independent culture and, and reach out a little bit, do things differently? Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And in my opinion, that should start in kindergarten, where we need to teach the kids that achievement and, and money and, and uh, progress, progress at work is not the most important thing. The most important thing is to know who are the people around you, who, who is your partner, and, and actually come out a little bit of your small circle and extend the hand to other people. That is many times more rewarding, as we know from uh, research on volunteering, than just taking care of number one. Yes, very important work that you do, Doctor. Uh, great to have you on the program, Dr. Rakesh, with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. When I initially broke up and she kind of hurt me, I was like, God, uh, like, just don't let me think about this girl. Like, that was messed up. Then there's conversations with God where I wanted Cassie back. And it was like, just like, let me be filled with grace. Like, I want to like, forgive. Then there was times where it was like, God, I just want her back. <laughs> Still ahead, finding love after a painful divorce. Melinda Estabrooks from See Here Love describes how she bounced back from one of life's most difficult challenges. And why aren't young people getting married as much now? A closer look at the trend. And is a healthy and long lasting marriage still possible? That's next. In recent years, there's been a paradigm shift in the attitudes and beliefs about marriage. Sheldon Neal now with marriage and family therapist Sharon Ramsey. So what do people know? What are the experts, such as yourself, saying about marriage? I would say that there's a lot of conversation that shifts the topic of marriage from just marriage itself to love. And I think part of that has to do with not everybody is choosing marriage as a way to have a long-term intimate relationship. 
A recent poll from the Angus Reid Institute finds people in this country, in Canada, are decidedly lukewarm on the fence about marriage. 47% say marriage is important to any couple looking to be serious about the relationship, but 53% of Canadians say marriage just isn't necessary. I mean, what do these stats reveal? Whether or not you have to be married in order to be happy, whether or not marriage is necessary to have a real relationship, I wonder if there's some of those questions behind it. And I would imagine that now that pe there's less stigma around people having, knowingly having sexual relationships, that marriage is not the only place in which sex can occur. And so if there was a time where if you wanted to have sex, you had to get married, then marriage is what we do. If it's now that, you know, your sexual relationships do not have to be within the bounds of marriage, people are finding other ways of establishing intimate couple relationships. How often does the perspective of marriage vary dependent on age? What comes to my mind is that what are the expectations and norms set up around you? So if marriage is this kind of um, expected rite of passage, I think back to my days in university, you would kind of hope to meet the person you were going to marry in university, you get married in your mid-20s, and then you go on to have children. If those kinds of expectations are no longer present, then that is not the first thing people are thinking about. It might be landing the job or the career or moving out from your parents' home and establishing your life that way. So I think that marriage is no longer that that expected step of adulthood. There could be some other things that people are prioritizing. How does cultural or traditional backgrounds affect one's perspective when weighing, you know, the call for marriage? I think if you are from a strong evangelical perspective, that marriage would be seen as what you do. If you are maybe in a higher socioeconomic bracket, let's say, and marriage is one, one of those ideas that happens with like-financed like families, that can be another idea. Or it might just be that um, as families, we choose the people we want to have into our families. And so it's not just about you falling in love with somebody. It's about having your family, aunts, uncles, parents choose another family and someone within that family that would be a good match to help the family in, into the future. What's the secret formula to a happy marriage? I would first ask, what do you think marriage is about? If marriage is some kind of financial bargain, then you got to figure out how much money you want. If marriage is about a reflection, if you're coming from a Christian perspective, a reflection of God's care and love for his people, that's a very different kind of relationship. If marriage is about finding your soulmate, the person you couldn't possibly live without, that's a different kind of pursuit. So what do you think marriage is about? What's it for? How do you benefit? Might be the, que might be the questions to help answer what, what makes a good marriage. Everyone in our life group was older and single. Wait, not that that's going to be your life. But, like, I get, I get it and I get that it's, like, scary and that the Lord kind of, like, flips our plans upside down sometimes. When marriage does not work, Melinda Estrebrooks from See Here Love shares her story of a painful divorce and finding love again. If I want one thing from God, it would be to make kind of my path clearer to me or make me content in it not being clear. A scene there from Young Once where young Christians are on the quest for love and marriage. At the same time, America's number one dating and relationship show, The Bachelor, is on the airwaves. One of the front runners there, Cassie, is on that show and we have her backstory on Young Once. Season two filmed just a few weeks before she went on The Bachelor. Pretty crazy. Okay, Carolyn Innes is the communications director here at Crossroads. Isaac Hainkamp is the digital marketing lead and they are all about this show right now. <laughs> Carolyn Cassie, of course, is a Christian. Uh, we know a little bit of her backstory, but she's gone on to the biggest reality show in America. <laughs> What's the draw here? Yeah, I, probably for Cassie, I mean, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but for contestants who are looking for a relationship and want to pursue a marriage, they know that going on The Bachelor, the outcome, hopefully, is a proposal. Mm. So if that's something that you seriously are considering, um, maybe it's not so crazy to go on a dating show to find the person you want to marry. Yeah, it's fascinating in 2019 mm -hmm. that, that marriage, still people are like, I want to be married yes. at some point. Uh, Isaac, you were uh, marketing young ones, right? You're trying to get the audiences interested in talking about it. Yeah. Um, why are we so fascinated with this topic? <laughs> and what are, what are you hearing online from people that are learning about it? 
Yeah, so uh, if they're not uh, being over the top dramatic that we're ruining their bachelor experience, <laughs> uh, they might be thanking us for kind of tying into the storyline that Young once plays into mm -hmm. uh, in terms of leading up to the bachelor and where Cassie was at and what she's coming from. So. Uh, the general response we're getting is we're making sure our content's getting in front of the people who are watching The Bachelor who are supporting her, mm -hmm. who don't know her backstory at this time, and we're making sure that it gets in front of those people so that they can hear her true story, see who Cassie truly is, um, and see a bit more of her character than I think we'd get to see on a show like The Bachelor, right? Yeah, the extended version, which oftentimes gets cut. Yeah, we certainly can't trust the producers of The Bachelor to tell Cassie's faith story, right? right? And so that's something that's really unique to Young Ones is that we've journeyed with this cast first for season one a number of years ago and then followed up again this summer with them. And we're looking at um, relationships, we're looking at some of the struggles they're facing and how God fits into all these intricate details of their lives. Okay, let's take a look at that. Cassie talking with her sister about a dilemma she's having. Let's take a look. I don't know if it's just not the right timing for me with him or if he's just not the guy for me because if he was then I would be 100 I just want to be 100 percent in if I'm gonna get back into it but are you kind of happy why would I be happy I mean I don't have any doubts about my decision not to be with him oh well this is the first time I'm hearing you say you have no doubts because every other time you have said that you have because before you were like really worried about it you're like could I be happy could I not be Getting back with Kaylin, I know where it's gonna go. Like we're probably gonna get married and have a family within like the next like three years if we <laughs> start talking right now. I don't know if that's right. I don't know if Kaylin's right. And so I don't wanna I want I don't wanna settle until I know something's right. She's asking questions that we all think about. Uh, mm. Isaac, what is your hope for young men and women as they take in young once? Uh, maybe they're watching it parallel to the bachelor at the same time. Mm. Um, I think Young Once, our show brings a really great perspective and, and balance to that because you get to see Cassie, who's been committed to uh, our guy Kaylin for, for quite a while. And you kind of get to see the difference between being on a show where there's multiple other girls fighting over the same guy who all feel like they're in the same relationship. And you get to see what she's like when she's in a committed relationship and fighting for somebody that she truly cares about and who she has history with. And the relationship has roots, right? Yep. So, so that's what I kind of see our show doing. Yeah, the depth of relationship for sure. Uh, Youngones.ca if you want to find out more about that show. And of course, it's on Castle for everyone to stream. Uh, great to have you both in today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, in the history of context, we've had two great weddings. One, of course, was Sheldon. And the other was with Melinda Esterbrooks, who joins me now. Melinda, you were a young producer at mm -hmm. Context back in the early days. Yes. And I'll remember your party was, the <laughs> wedding party was <laughs> spectacular. Rooftop, yeah, we all had such a blast. Mm -hmm. And then I remember um, after the first year, just within the first year, Mark, we were getting excited because you, you were going to have to move yeah. and uh, move for your husband's new business. Mm -hmm. And I remember you standing in the doorway of the production room and you looked at me and you said, he's not taking me with him. Yeah. You never expected your marriage to end. No, never. And I think that, especially in the context of covenant and commitment and as a follower of Jesus, you think that when you make that decision, and I waited for a while, I was in my 30s. Yeah. And you did so many tests. Yes, and you were I in did. Premarital and pre and pre engagement did. counseling. You guys did so much groundwork yeah. to get married. Yeah. And it failed. And I think the feeling when that happens, when you're confronted with, he's not going to take me with him, and an impending separation and divorce, is that I am a failure and full of shame. It wasn't easy the next couple no. of years, was it? Tell us no. what those that journey was like. Well, when you are dealt with someone leaving you, I've been told that it's even worse than death because they've chosen to leave you. And so you're really confronted with grief and anger and shame. Really difficult. I hid away for a year. I only told my closest friends what had happened. Um, but I'm thankful for a community who really rallied around me. But I had to really rebuild. I actually had to think about, was I not wise in who I chose? What did I do wrong within the marriage? What could I have done better? I did a lot of blaming of myself. What did you and God feel like during <laughs> that time? 
I, I believe God was in it. I think we just weren't intentional about communication and also being open with community about our problems. I think the biggest issue for us was that we were keeping our problems internal and hidden away in our home and not telling people about what was happening. You, you went through a number of years of healing, mm -hmm. of just just being Mel, yeah. and then all of a sudden you, not all of a sudden actually, it was a long time, <laughs> was. you started to date. Yes. And you dated a long time. Yes. Tell us about Chris and starting another yes. relationship. Well, I will be honest, when you go through a divorce, you're very wary of stepping back into the dating pool. And I was really nervous because what if I fail again? What if I don't choose the right person again? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it took a while with Chris and I because I really wanted to be sure that he was the right person. So there was therapy, there was a lot of accountability. He even took out my friends on dates to make sure that they knew his intentions. Okay, but so you're both been married before. Yes. How did you not bring the old baggage right. into this new thing? You know, I always heard the saying, Lorna, that wherever you go, there you are. And I knew that if I wanted a successful relationship or marriage in the future, I had to deal with my stuff. And that means I had to do the hard work of therapy and doing a lot of journaling and talking to people and going to silent retreats and having a lot of prayer times with God and a lot of like rages and cries <laughs> to say, in me, in the broken places, God expose those so I don't bring those into another relationship. Because this, so you and Chris have gotten married yes. and he's got children, you, <laughs> like crazy Mel. You I know, Lord, and you know, right? I never wanted kids, I never <laughs> wanted children. And it's a funny thing when I said to God, I don't want to uh, marry a pastor, a worship leader, or a guy with kids. And he's one, two, three. three, he's all three. All three, and they're not just kids. No, they they're were, and now already they're already well-formed preteens. Yeah, yes, and now they're tweens and a teenager. But it was tough, I think, blended family. I honor and celebrate anybody who's in a blended family or a step-parent, because it hasn't been easy, but it's worth it. One of the things that I feel has come out of your phoenix of arising into the new Melinda yeah. is um, you created a show. You created See, Hear, Love. Yeah. And when I'm looking at your podcast, is so often about relationships. It is. Why is it just inescapable that yeah. we get this right? It's, and it's, well, it's core for me. And I think part of why I do these shows is because I'm learning through the shows. It's actually my own personal therapy. As long as I'm writing <laughs> scripts, I'm like, I'm learning through what I'm writing. It's important, I think, that relationships with a church community, with family, with your tribe, your girlfriends is important, but also getting it right, not perfectly, but getting it right and honest in a marriage relationship is so important. We're thrilled that, um, we're thrilled for you and Chris Thank and what you. a beautiful family you are now and that there is second beginnings. The whole journey has taken <laughs> over 15 years, yes. so it's not been quick. And we're thrilled that you stepped from context to now this new see, hear, love, yeah. awesome. And uh, thanks, Mel. Thank you, Lena. And if today's program on relationships and loneliness opened more than we can finish right now, remember our prayer lines are open 24 seven for you to call if you need to talk to someone about your relationships or marriage or for a miracle new beginning of hope. So for all of us at Context, thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week.